know, if you think about it, the field for the best podcast as voted on by uh, mm. the readers of the coast are kind of like Halifax's own multiverse of madness. Oh, okay, please do tell. I didn't think that oh. far, but again, <laughs> but when you think about it in general, it's it's a meeting of different universes into mm. one nexus mm. and seeing which one is going to be left over when mm. all said and done. Mm. Well, hopefully that's us, Will. Whatever oh, happens oh with... Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I hope we're we're still standing, you know, when the uh, wrath of the uh, Halifax Coast Awards doth come. Thank you, everybody, for getting us nominated. Big time. That's the, great. The, the, yeah, this is the pained lead-in to what we wanted to start off with here on Elwood City Limits, the episodic Arthur podcast. Uh, Will Young here and Lucas Mancini. Yes, we want to say a big thank you here on the Prime Show for... Uh, getting us nominated one of the nominees of best podcast once again in the best of Halifax awards which are put on by our local publication uh, The Coast so thank you it is uh, we're in a tight field this year as we usually are there's some popular shows in there and some newcomers I'm always interested to know what's on the horizon for the podcast landscape in Halifax and in Nova Scotia and thank you all for getting us here and as we have said before, and as we've said many years before, we would really appreciate it if you go and vote for us. And the way you do that is to go to vote.thecoast.ca. We are in the music and culture section under best podcast, and Elwood City Limits is there. You just have to vote. You will have to uh, register with the website in order to vote, but that only takes a minute, and it takes less than a couple seconds to vote for Elwood City Limits as best podcast. Yeah, we're halfway there. Uh, we're on the home stretch now. Uh, thank you so much for supporting us thus far, but uh, we need your help. You know, Elwood City Fateful, we got to charge the spirit bomb. And by charge the spirit bomb, I mean go to vote.thecoast.ca and vote for us. Please and thank you. And as we said with nominations, if you do vote for us, Please let us know via social media or send it in an email, and we can properly thank you. This is something that we've done the past few years, in case you're new to the show. Um, we just, we we like the coast when it was a publication, a regular publication, read it all the time. And there's a lot of local luminaries and legends that have won a coast award. Now, I, I don't mean this to be too humble or, you know, um, or shooting too low, I suppose, but... We're not exactly asking for you to make us, you know, the gold winner. There's gold, there's silver, and there's bronze. We would be happy with bronze. We know that this oh, is stiff yeah. competition. We know that a lot of these podcasts have big, big audiences. And we are we are but a humble show about everybody's favorite aardvark. But we do want to give it a try. And every year we get new listeners, and we hope that you would be so kind as to vote for us to be best podcast. Even if it ends up with bronze, that would be awesome. If not, well, we'll try again next year. But it's now time to try for this year. So, again, vote.thecoast.ca. Please and thank you. Vote us for best podcast. Folks, if we get bronze, we get a fancy plaque. We still get to go to the fancy party. And that's right. We do get a free cocktail. So if you want to see pictures <laughs> of me and Will in suits at a fancy party with our free talk cocktails and our, our nice bronze plaque, uh, yes, run. Don't walk. To go vote for us. It would be a cool thing to have. Now that we are celebrating six years. Now, oh, we're, wow. we're going to be celebrating six years properly with our patrons next week. Because uh, the next episode of For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast, lands on our exact six-year anniversary. Six years to the day that the first episode of Elwood City Limits came out. But we wanted to take some time, of course to just bring it up on here because, well, the schedule is going to be a little bit different in the next few weeks, and you may not hear from us uh, so up-to-date, so current very soon. So let us take a moment to say, as we are on the eve of it here, we're about nine days away, thank you for six years of this podcast. We really and truly, and I say this a lot, and it is 100% legit, 
We couldn't have been here without you. We couldn't have done this without you. Yeah, I, I'm going to be – thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and I'm really going to be busy with work this this latter half of the year. But uh, uh, even if it's delayed or, or uh, belated, we're definitely looking to do some sort of live stream or something in the future months uh, to commemorate kind of six years. I know everybody liked – that we haven't forgotten about the Twitch channel. And so I'm looking to return to that sooner rather than later. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. And, I mean – well, I'll you know maybe I'll get a bit mushy at the end of the episode. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about, but I just wanted to make sure to bring that up in case we, you know, the the next uh, bit of time takes us away from that thought. It it will be six years very very soon, and it's crazy to think about that. Six years now, going on seven, and uh, we're what's very uh happy what's to be the here. six year anniversary gift? Let's see. Is it like the cardboard anniversary? What is uh, no, I think year? we passed cardboard. I think um, I Ooh. think. The hmm. candy anniversary. The candy anniversary. Oh. Or or, or or wood? Wait, I can't tell. Traditional okay. gift is candy. Hmm. Or or contemporary modern gift is wood. Well, I know which one I want. <laughs> Maybe compromise and get us some wood candy or something. Or mm. um, oh, is that maple? I guess it's maple. Yeah. Yeah, you could split the. <laughs> I, 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 I'll allow it. I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, we do have a lot to talk about as we're into a new season of Arthur. But before any of that, let's head over to our emails. We have a few, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com, where you can send in your emails. Uh, well, our first one here is from a patron, Michelle Sprzynski. Hey, Will, Lucas, and Mike. It's been a while since I've written to you guys. I was wondering if you guys ever watched Degrassi. Not that I think all Canadians automatically watched it, but being from the U.S., it was my jam back in the day. I recently started a rewatch of all the seasons, and I was trying to think of which Arthur characters would correspond to the Degrassi characters. A little hard to compare 8-year-olds to 7th and 12th graders, I know, but I thought it would be fun. Feel free to share your thoughts. Keep in mind, I was in about 5th grade when Degrassi The Next Generation started airing in 2001, and I fell off the wagon a bit when the cast started to change drastically, so my list of characters is a bit limited to the earlier seasons. So, uh... But before we get into the list, Lucas Degrassi. Yeah, I and this is it's always funny when I hear about Americans knowing about Degrassi. It's a funny, it's just interesting that that's one of Canada's like cultural exports. Um, but yeah. I absolutely had a Degrassi the Next Generation phase. Now I don't know how much help I'm going to be in contributing to character comparisons because, with the exception of of course Jimmy, uh, who would go on to be known as uh, Drake Aubrey Graham otherwise known as Drizzy Dre, Champagne Poppy himself. Um, Drizzy Drake, rather. Uh, with the exception of him, uh, I, I don't actually remember anybody's name, nor do I even know what, lack of a better term, generation mm -hmm. of Degrassi The Next Generation cast I was watching. Because it is one of those shows that it's been going on so long. You know, Degrassi The Next Generation is already a completely new iteration of Degrassi proper. Yeah. And then even within that... Within seasons, people are aging out. New people are getting introduced. Um, it's very much like a soap opera in that way. We've already moved on to Degrassi Voyager and Degrassi Deep School Nine. <laughs> and then Degrassi... Degrassi Enterprise, it really falls off with well, the whales. Yeah. I don't know. Some people like Degrassi Discovery. And then there's Degrassi uh, Snake. And I'm just not a... Meh. Wasn't really into that. Um, I So I did also have a big Degrassi phase when I was around the appropriate age, junior high into high school, when it was on CTV. Um, so I watched a lot of The Next Generation. So I, did, I, I do appreciate this email. This one's from my Degrassi heads. By the way, some great long-form Degrassi YouTube reviews. Uh, go to uh, channels called You've Got Cat, K-A-T, on YouTube. Uh, their Degrassi reviews are awesome. Uh, I, love, I love watching them, and I can't wait for the next one. Okay, so for my Degrassi heads here, uh, so Arthur would be Toby, which I agree. Nerdy, book smart, kind, and pretty anxious. Buster, JT without a doubt. Yeah, no, absolutely. These are one-to-one. -one. Okay, so Lucas, here's here we go. Francine is Jimmy. Yes, b different genders, but they're both sporty, witty, and everyone likes them. Oh, gosh. I hope France fate is kinder to Francine. <laughs> yes, let's hope so. Uh, Muffy as Paige? Yeah, totally. DW as Liberty, if only for the one-liners. Mm, yeah, 
maybe, maybe. I'm less certain about that one. Binky is Spinner, only Binky is more mature. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Sue Ellen is Emma. I'm back and forth on this one, but it's mostly because they both have an activist mentality. I was almost thinking Sue Ellen would be more Liberty, and who would be Emma? I mean, um, I could see... Well, this contradicts with what uh, Michelle's going to say later. I don't know, maybe F Fern, potentially? But yeah, it's not one-to-one. -one. Uh, Fern, Ellie or Ashley? Yes, in fact, maybe a combination. I can't really think of anyone who George or the Brain can relate to. Let me know if you have any ideas. Some main Degrassi characters missing are Craig, Sean, Manny, Hazel, Marco, and Terry. There never really was, like, a super brainy one, except for, um, except for Toby, but he was also... I, I do I do like him as Arthur better. And George, kind of the quiet one. I, uh, what was the name of Terry's boyfriend that treated her really bad? That's like the, the one who shot Jimmy. That's the closest one I can think of. <laughs> but uh, no, George is way better than that. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, if you guys were not into Degrassi enough to read this on the air, I totally understand. Uh, loving your podcast. Keep up the good work. Hope you win the Best of Halifax podcast. Thank you, Michelle. We have another piece of correspondence from another uh, another patron, Vinny Cataldo, who is uh, going to lay down the top ten worst Arthur episodes, in his opinion. So, if you have any disagreements with this, this is this is Vinny's opinion, not ours. So seek him out, and uh, you can you can uh, uh, spark up some discussion. So, and right away, Vinny, you're killing me here. Number ten, DW's baby. Don't necessarily hate the episode, but DW comes off as a little unlikable in this one. I do love the ending message with Grandma Thora, but it just wasn't a personal favorite. Well, Vinny, you knew what you were doing. You know that I've said that Arthur's baby, DW's baby, is my favorite Arthur episode. So you're you're just you're just looking to make you're just looking to make me mad. Mm -hmm. You're just you're He's just taking... generating hot takes. The mm. takes are sizzling. You're making me A is for angry, which is his number nine. Muffy spreading false news about Arthur really made my dislike for Muffy grow. I can feel Arthur's frustration, but Muffy's news reports put this one on the list. I actually don't have a good memory of that one. I know we've watched it, but it didn't leave an impression on me. Number eight, For Whom the Bell Tolls. Love the Metallica song, hate this episode. DW basically turning Arthur into a slave while she pretends to be sick is just awful. And much like what you'll see with this list, Jane and David really give her no punishment. Uh, we're back to this talking point, huh, Lucas? Oh, you, you know, you know, they should they should have beaten DW. They should have. It's they true. Beaten it's true. Her. I know. They Vinny, should have Vinny, sold Vinny, her, Vinny. I, like, uh, I, I know that's not what you're saying. I'm 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 just, I'm just <laughs> joshing. But you know, sometimes the conversation can go a little bit close to that. You know. <laughs> You know, I, 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 you know, some, some people just like they don't endorse any form of parent on child violence, except when it comes to the animated cartoon characters they dislike. Mm -mm. But that's not what that's not what you're saying, Benny. Number seven, poor Muffy. Another Muffy episode, another really horrible plot. I can understand that Muffy is spoiled. This made me hate her even more. Number six, DW's very bad mood. Infamous for good reason. The fact that DW's being a jerk to everyone and no punishment is given is annoying to sit through. I used to think so, and now I kind of like it just because it's it, it gives us some classic DW banter. I can, I can deal with it. Arthur's big hit. DW gets absolutely no punishment. Yes, we're bringing this up again. Sorry. Uh, even though Arthur told her many times not to touch the plane, uh, so on and so forth. Vinny's very passionate about this one, as ma as many are. Yeah, we're going to be talking about this one until the cows come home, I see. Number four, play it again, DW. Uh, 532 times listening to Crazy Bus would drive my parents to send me off to boarding school, but DW gets absolutely no punishment. I'm starting to starting to see a theme here. Theme here, Lucas. Yeah, I, and also, this is I, I feel like he's doing this on purpose, but come on. You're telling me that parents send their child off to boarding school for playing GD cra uh, uh, I almost called it crazy shark crazy uh, bus. baby shark I, I feel like that's just like a kid thing like don't they just want to listen to one song and yes. isn't that one song baby shark yeah absolutely no totally that's that's part of the admission when you're being a parent they're gonna mm. play stuff all the time and you're gonna get sick of it now this is and, th th and crazy bus is an improvement that's a better song oh then baby shark sure sure oh yeah um, I think <laughs> it's also that the fact that it's a cartoon of just like, we can blow it up to insane proportions and some, uh, sometimes we get a little stuck in the weeds. Number three, attack of the turbo tibbles again, 
Absolutely no punishment for the Tibbles. Grandma Tibble is just awful. If it were me, I would have gotten a big spanking for being that dumb. I will say this. I will say this. The Tibbles um, having sort of a, uh, um, let's say, hands-off uh, parenting style, like yes. you know, Grandma Tibble not being the most engaged with uh, sort of their ongoing, their 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 comings and goings, mm-hmm. is kind of integral to their character. Uh, I, I feel like that's actually within the logic of the show. That's intentional. That the Tibbles are like, uh, let's say a little bit naughty because <laughs> they're not kept under a tight leash, much like uh, Arthur and even DW <laughs> are kept under a little bit more of a tight leash. Number two, um, this is one we haven't covered yet. So funny, I forgot to laugh. Apparently, most most of our uh, patrons in the Discord despise this episode, so we'll get to oh. it eventually. So I won't get, won't get too far into it, Vinny, but interesting. Number one, Kung Fool. So uh, a Fern episode. This episode has absolutely no story, no message, no importance in Fern's life. It was a waste of 11 minutes. I found myself so lost throughout the entire thing it's definitely down there like th- this i agree with you Vinny. that was a that was a nothing episode so yeah, the, uh, o- it- the only thing about that episode was having a cool old man besides that <laughs> not much else yeah really um thanks for all the fun in the discord you guys always brighten my day with posts and funny memes well thank you Vinny. you're always good for a conversation over there and again not you know not trying to blow up your spot or anything thank you for your for um for your opinion here we always appreciate hearing it and how differently we Arthur fans can think sometimes. Our next one is from Carter. Uh, I voted for you, the Coast Best of Halifax 2022. Hey, thank you, Carter. Really appreciate it. I hope you guys will win. You guys have a nice podcast. My favorite episodes are when you interviewed Dallas Joe Kick and Jason Schwimmer, which I recently put up on our YouTube page. If you'd like to watch that again, uh, youtube.com slash Elwood City Limits. It was nice to hear those two talk about how they became the voices of Arthur and DW and what they're doing right now. Jason Schwimmer did a great job of doing the Finding DW podcast. I heard an episode of your podcast. uh, Jason said he'd love to do a Finding Arthur podcast, but he doesn't have the time and energy right now. I understand that he's working on some other stuff right now, and when he's almost done with that stuff, I would hopefully send him an email, and maybe one day if he says, I'm going to do a Finding Arthur podcast, I'd be proud. I want to become a children's author and illustrator like Mark Brown. I'm working on my first book. Well, awesome, Carter. I hope to be able to see it when it's all done. Thank you very much for your email. And, hey, if you're looking for more Jason Schwimmer content, uh, just search his name in YouTube. He came out with a great uh, short, it's like less than 10 minutes, YouTube video about VIP Kid. What's VIP Kid? He can explain it to you, but it was really good. Jason, uh, Jason's really talented as an editor and as an interviewer, and you can see those on display in this video. So yeah, Jason Schwimmer on YouTube. We put it on our social media. Check it out. It's really good. Damn, six years, Will. You're you're sharing the love this week. We got a lot of love going around here in uh, the Elwood City uh, universe. We've made a lot of great friends over the years, and, uh, well, it's it's hard not to feel the love in times like this. We also want to spread the love to those of you who uh, have supported us monetarily at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. First of all, welcome to our new patrons, Queenie Rose, Melissa H., Kaija, and Emilio C. Welcome to the Patreon. We really appreciate you being here. Also want to say happy birthday to one of our patrons, Casey Cosmos. On the day we are recording this, it is their birthday. By Friday, it'll be past their birthday, but happy slash, or in parentheses, belated birthday, Casey. I already sent you uh, happy birthday wishes on uh, Twitter as well. Also want to say thanks to our patrons in the Discord who have taken it upon themselves to make emojis for the Discord. Uh, that would be Wasatch Wind, Awesome Eddie 21, and Bradley Boy. We have some spiffy new Discord emojis, and that's all thanks to their efforts. So thank you all very much. We also want to thank other patrons such as Sid Ups and Jared G, Jeff L, Rory Forever, Richard Mortimer, and Anthony Williams, Flying Sparks 32, uh, Kelly Corbett, Alistair, Nicholas DeMarco, Revd, Christine Lascody, Rachel Pearson, Riley Stevens, Emily Kay. We're on to three pages now, guys. Teresa, Ian Collis, and John Griswold. Again, thank you so much, everybody. So, 
Last week, we had our Arthur Season 14 recap. It's very fun to hear about Lucas's thoughts on the entire season and to scare up my own top five of the season. But now we're entering Uncharted territory once again. We're in Arthur Season 15. Not a lot of notes about this new season. It aired from October 2011 to June 2012. It was in the same production cycle as Season 14. And as we discussed in the Season 14 premiere episode... Um, some of the these episodes actually aired as kind of a combined season 14 in some other territories with the season 14 episodes. So October 2011 to June 2012, let's see, I was finishing, I had already finished, um, no, excuse me, uh, I know, I still was in university, I was going into my last year of university. By June 2012, I was completely graduated with an English degree and I had no idea what I wanted to do with it. Yeah, for me, June 2012, I would have just been finishing up uh, my grade 11 high school year and getting ready to enter into grade 12. Slowly but surely, Lucas, we're coming to the first year where we would have met each other. So we haven't Whoa. met each other yet. But very That's soon. crazy. Yeah, I know, right? And the only other note that I wanted to make about this season of what I could find, you know, there's a lot of voice actors for whom this is their last season. And speaking of lasts, this is it. The final Arthur season with traditional animation. Starting with season 16, which we will get into at a future date, we're going to flash. So, it's Lucas, you gotta love it while it's here, because it'll mm-hmm. be gone before you know it. You know, this season, Will, I'm going to try and practice that exact mentality. I'm going to complain less about, like, oh, Flash is right around the corner, because we're really going to just soak up and enjoy what we have before it's gone. So, season 15 is the celebration of traditional animation. We'll save our our Flash comments for when it's actually here. So, let's yeah. we're starting off on a positive note, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And the premiere episode of Arthur season 15 is another double episode, which they seem to be more willing to do around this time, which I appreciate. I like the double episodes, and it's called 15, of course. Lucas, do you ever feel like you're constantly in a rush and like you're running out of time? Even when you're relaxing, you can't do the things you want to do because you always have to go somewhere else? Why, yes, Will, I do. In fact, I think that's a pretty universal feeling. Yeah, especially these days when I've been super stressed this month so far, and I just feel like I can't catch a moment's breath before I have to go and do something else. (laughs) You're right, Will. I'll sit down, I'll be like, ah, time to relax, and then all of a sudden that Be Real notification hits, and now i got to take a Be Real picture or else it's going to go away in two minutes. Okay, Okay, so you're into Be Real as well. Oh, I'm Be Real pilled, big time. It's the future, Will. So, All right, so... You get the is is it at the same time every day or is it just random times? Well, aren't you sick and tired of how just gosh darn fake everybody is all the time? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you, man. You pull up Instagram, you pull up your TikTok, and you're like, "Wow, look at all these phonies!" If right, only there was a way to ins- <laughs> if only there was a way to ensure that everybody was being real. Because I know I'm real, but how do I know if everybody else is? Well, <laughs> enter Be Real, Will. Uh, it, the notification, you never know when it's going to hit. And when it does, you got to stop, drop, and be real. Do you get to set your hours or something? Like, it's not notifying you at, like, 3 o'clock in the morning, is it? It indeed is sometimes notifying no you at No way, in the come morning. on. Yes, because it, it's, it's the same Be Real time for everybody on planet Earth. So it has to, you know, be for different time zones and oh stuff. Oh, my God. You're not taking the picture if that's the case, right? You're not waking up. No, when it's I, 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 I got two dot disturb turned on. So whenever that happens, I wake Good. up to the be real notification. Okay. But then it tells on me that I'm posting it, you know, six hours late or oh. whatever. That's the other thing is it tells on you. Sorry, I was in the real. middle of a REM cycle. <laughs> Come on, like, like I think the I think the idea is neat, but when we're talking about this, it's just like don't bother me off hours, like when I'm not on this planet mentally, like. How about no? Anyway, I'm glad you're getting something out of it. When you're being real, Will, there is no off hours. I'm real 24-7, 365. I'm keeping it a buck. No, you're right. You're right. Um, (laughs) Maybe I'm not as real as I think I am, if if that's my attitude. (laughs) 
Anyway, that's the uh, that's the basis of this Arthur Cold Open, as he's trying to get stuff done and keeps getting rushed to everything. In fact, he's getting rushed out of the Cold Open as he's trying to play some kind of video game. It looked like he was playing on a SNES or something, and Buster is, ends up counting down the end of the Cold Open, literally counting the seconds on the screen as Arthur is being shuffled into the episode. A little bit more, a little bit more of that. Uh, uh, of that meta-ness that the cold humor allows, f- the cold open allows for. Um, yeah, 15, 15 seasons of that. Well, speaking of 15 seasons, so we get this title screen of 15, and it's actually, like, a pretty impactful title. Like, I don't think we've gotten an episode that's just called the name of the season yet. Um, and I, this is something that I've realized, you know, in the way that we watch Arthur, which is a lot more like how people watch, like, prestige TV or something, as opposed to how <laughs> I watched it when I was a kid, which was, whatever's on is on. I don't care if it's a syndicated episode or a repeat, I'm just watching Arthur. Um, is that, you know, it kind of makes it feel a little bit more like an event. Like, season 14 is over. We are here with the grand return of season 15. Um, and that comes through both in the title and the fact that this is indeed a two-parter. Um instead of being two kind of separate stories, 15 is just 24 minutes uncut of one Arthur story, which um, is a pretty exciting way to start a season. The only thing closest that we've gotten is the season 10 premiere, which was called Happy Anniversary, which was, uh, you know, it was a reference to something in the show, but also a reference to the fact that it was like a, a big 10 years of Arthur kind of anniversary. So in the actual episode... We have a couple of threads going on here. The first one that we're introduced to is that George is going to be appearing on a radio quiz show called 15 Minutes of Fame. And if he wins, he'll get $500 that'll go to the school, which ugh, kind of a rip off, honestly. The kids who went on Jep and Wheel 2000 didn't have to give those prizes to the school. <laughs> it's true. Mm. Anyway, um... The Mr. Uh, Mr. Haney, the joke throughout the episode is that he keeps turning on the PA and it's very screechy, which we, yes. uh, which is a joke that we've used before. I'm pretty sure he refers to George as George Lung Drain. So we we do we do have further confirmation that George's last name is Lundgren. Um, if George or sorry, the other the second thread that we have here has to do with a homework policy that Mr. Ratburn has instituted, which is his merit points system. And the class is very close to getting to 500 points. And if they get to 500 points, they get a no homework day. But in order to get there, everybody has to bring in their assignment on time the day it is due. So we have our stakes set up here. It reminded me a little bit of School of Rock, how they have the demerit point system there. And I've been in I've been in classrooms before where, like, we've had, you know, point systems based on, like, how good we are or, like, how much homework is done. I feel like this system only really works in elementary school because I remember that as oh, yeah. well. Like, there was being, like, um, point systems of, like, oh, we're going to reward the class with a pizza party if we all work together. Right. Uh, because once you get into those later years of junior high and high school, it very much does become sink or swim, every man for themselves. Uh, listen, if I want to pass this in late, I'm going to pass this la- in late. Um, effects to the class, be damned. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, at that point, you can't you can't bribe kids into into doing well. They either will or they won't. So the key part of this whole report thing is that the next day, Arthur forgets his report at home. As he's talking to Buster about it, Buster's report is on a Dutch painter named Peter Bruegel. And Buster is cut off before he's able to tell Arthur what his nickname is. I looked it up. Peter Bruegel's nickname was Peasant Bruegel to distinguish from the other painters in the Bruegel family at the time. But Arthur's report is on Michelangelo, which I actually did a report on Michelangelo in junior high. So when he oh, was really? so later on in the episode when he was like like Michelangelo's full name, I knew that at one point. Not uh, not anymore. I've you know video games and. <laughs> Uh, wrestling have killed a lot of my inherent knowledge that I learned through the public education system, but I did know that at one point. You were like uh, all the listeners who, whenever we get a fact wrong, they're like screaming at their phones or whatever. <laughs> uh, you were like yelling at Arthur, like, this is the answer. Well, I was more yelling at myself of just like, you used to know things. You used to know this. What happened? Um, so re- Arthur's report on Michelangelo is back at school. So... He makes the decision to go back home and get it, even though that will make him late. 
And um, which I th- think is the right move when he was balancing like, oh, should I be late or should I? I was like, dude, be late. Come on. Like the whole class is going to hate you. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, th- I think I think he made the right call. Um, so as he goes back home, Arthur's headed back home for this. Dad Reed back at home uh, notices that Arthur left his report as he is on his way out and he volunteers to drop it off at school. Now we get into the we have an A plot, a B plot, and a C plot, or a one, two, three plot, mm-hmm. whatever you want to say. The C plot here, and I think it belongs to C. Pal and Kate uh, decide that they want to help get the report back. They didn't hear everything that Dad said because, of course, they neither of them can understand English terribly well. But they know that you know something about the report, and uh, it's going to be big trouble. So they think they can help by finding a key that belongs to Dad and then seeing what it unlocks. First of all, when Pal goes in to tell Kate about what's happening, I really like the image of Kate just, like, casually reading, like, a book. It, and it looked like a big <laughs> book. I don't know. Just something about that really tickled me. She just had a book open and then just uh, just kind of like, yeah, what's up? <laughs> I will I will say that when this was revealed to be the, the C plot for um, – I, I did audibly groan. I was like, oh, yeah. no. But but I also kind of wasn't sure at this moment in the episode if this was the C-plot or if, like, everything else we had seen the, to this point was, like, set dressing and this was going to actually be the kind of main adventure was whatever Pal and Kate were up to. By the way, did we mention about uh, the dream sequence, the imagination sequence? No, we didn't. Uh, no, we didn't. Um, and I think that's okay. – uh, we, de- we definitely should. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> So, yes, um, when talking about how important it is for everybody to get to the reports on time so they have no homework day, uh, Buster is pontificating about, you know, uh, Mr. Rapburn is so kind of hard that knowing him, he'll probably actually make an extra homework day as a punishment. Um, and we get a glimpse of what extra homework day looks like in Buster's mind's eye. Uh, Muffy is told that she needs to learn French in 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, and my favorite part is... My, mine too. Bink- yeah. Uh, he says to Binky, Binky, write a novel and don't try to hand in a novella. <laughs> That's a good joke. That's a very good joke. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. And then everybody hates Arthur and that's where his anxiety kind of fuels him forward. So I will say, th- I didn't have the groan about this yet because it made sense. Like we have a we have a kind of Arthur's friends plot. We have an Arthur plot, and then we have a baby and dog story. I'm like, okay, so if we're gonna do multiple stories, yeah, all right, I can see there being time for them. I will also say their whole thing at first, at least, with trying to find out what fits a key. When I was very young, when I was around the age that the baby and dog stories are for, um. Keys were one of my favorite things. It's weird, it's weird to say, but like that's a perfect hook for a mystery for a little kid, and even you can you can hook a grown adult with this. What's better than a mystery about what a key is supposed to unlock? It's true. When you're a little kid, you have like uh, Monkey Island goggles on at all times. Where you're like, <laughs> well, this key has to be for something important. <laughs> Surely it's not just some stranger's bike lock. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good point. Um, so yeah, they are going to find out what this key opens. It's a very simple, s- small silver key. Um, Arthur goes back to his, is going back to his house. He's biking back and he runs across George and who also has Wally. So Wally's in this episode too. Um, and George needs a little bit of help to prepare with some trivia questions. So Arthur gives him a little bit of time and helps him to prepare with some, you know, general historical and cultural trivia. Um, Arthur, uh, th- this, I love that they keep calling back to this. Arthur is on his way back to his house. He's biking and he wipes out because a squirrel enters his path and it scares him and he steers off the road. It was great. I love that we keep referring to how much Arthur and Buster specifically are scared of squirrels because of that scary movie they saw. <laughs> Oh, I didn't even put that together. That's a good catch. Like, it is literally because of that squirrel movie. (laughs) No, yeah, absolutely that's what it's for. So we go back to the dog and baby. They open – they find out that the the key opens, like, a bureau in the Reed family house. And they find, like, a postcard of some sort. And it's, like, the Arthur version of the Mona Lisa, I guess it kind of looks like. And then all of a sudden – because these stories can't not have him in it. 
Nemo just runs in through the window and grabs it. <laughs> just like, uh, well, okay. I guess, like, like really, every time that they do one of these, it's like Nemo just kind of ends up showing up and just being there for no reason. And in this well, episode, it the, literally the is, is for no reason. The reason is the, the you know, the dog and the babies live privileged lives that are very <laughs> without conflict, and yeah. Nemo is their antagonist. <laughs> but I'm actually, I was relieved to see Nemo. I, I, I um, as far as these dog and baby episodes go, um, he continues to be my favorite part of them, just because I've always kind of had a soft spot for this type of character, whether it's uh, Megatron in Beast Wars or if it's Dr. Fraser Crane himself, uh, <laughs> this this character type will, will always get a kick out of me. Kind of kind of snooty, upper crust, uh, yes. stuffed shirt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that those are your examples. Fraser, Megatron, and Nemo. Yeah, a little bit of Hans Gruber, too. Yeah. Oh, man, what a murderer's row that is. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, one quick thing I want to say, because, you know, throughout the episode, George is consulting with wally to help him like he's he's going to the radio station he's getting all dressed up and he's like oh wally's gonna help me help me remember all this stuff he's taking the bus to the radio station and like (laughs) george is talking to wally openly and like wally says hello to a woman next to them on the bus and then the woman just pushes the button to be let off i thought that was there was really good comedic timing there i really yes that. that was hilarious and actually, this is like the first time Arthur has ever acknowledged kind of how overtly weird it is that George has Wally with him all the time. <laughs> like, we get a, a sort of unengaged stranger, and it's like, okay, yeah, what's her take on this child who talks through this puppet? Uh, and she's like, I gotta get off this bus one stop early. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll walk. <laughs> yeah, just like throwing up her hands and just like, oh, nope, this is not my deal. Okay, so, back to the dog and baby. And, and, and we're kind of... Uh, truncating some of this because this is all unfolding through three different like scene transitions and all that kind of thing. Kate and Pal are wondering about why Nemo stole that postcard. And then Nadine appears. Now I can't, we had an episode with them together. So we've already established, I think that Nadine, Pal and Kate can interact with one another. And then that extends to Trini, who is Visita's imaginary friend, and Uncle Wormy, who is the Tibble's imaginary friend. Okay, have we seen Uncle Wormy before? Now, we've seen that worm used before, but it was in like a nightmare sequence for the brain a couple of seasons ago. Okay. So, Uh, I I love Uncle Wormy. (laughs) It's a good gag where we like, okay, we've seen Nadine... We even get reintroduced to Trini, who it's just funny to hear Trini say, hola, and it's like, oh, yeah, like, everybody's got their own imaginary friend. Yeah. And then the big reveal, like, Uncle Wormy shows up before she explains who he is, and I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> it's like, whoa. And then she's like, oh, this is the Tibble. One, it's cute the Tibble share one imaginary friend. That's fun. Um, like, yeah. they both <laughs> chill with Uncle Wormy. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Two, um... I don't know. It's just so funny because, like, Nadine and Trini, they're so pretty. They're fairy-like. They're, like, magical kind of fae creatures. And then Uncle Wormy is, like, he's got, like, a a, a wrestling belt in, in, with um, UW inscribed on it. Right. Um, his, his shirt is in tatters. He is dripping some sort of green ooze. He's got um, one eye. Yeah. He's got one eye. He's, like, at least three feet taller than all the other imaginary friends. Um, they don't let him really speak, but I'm a big... I'm a Uncle Wormy fan, for sure. He's, um... And, and, and he's quite unpleasant. Like, every time he speaks, it's just kind of like... <laughs> like, he's kind of vomiting <laughs> while he speaks. It's really, it's really off-putting. Um, yeah, apparently he was in Baby Kate and the Imaginary Mystery, so we have seen him before, and we've seen that type of worm before. It's, you know, he's not... He's not evil or mean or anything. He's just kind of unpleasant to look at. It's very like it it it, it almost harkens back to like you would expect that Uncle Wormy would have been introduced when Arthur was in the 90s back when like gross out stuff for kids was at its height when you had like creepy crawlers and stuff like that, but no, this is just uh this is very fairly new uh for the Arthur universe. He's the machinations of the the Tibble's twisted minds. <laughs> The inner machinations are their mind are an enigma, except for Uncle Wormy. So Nadine tells Caden Pal that what Nemo stole. <sighs> Nemo is a part of an organization of cats 
called the Red Claw. And the Red Claw want to eliminate imaginary friends so that humans will spend more time with pets. We even get a cutaway where Nemo goes to like an underground lair and laughs evilly. And there's like a recipe on this postcard that will enable them to do that. This is when I audibly groaned. I was just like, oh. (laughs) And you know what? It's not even like what it's not even what Nadine is talking about. It's just that it's in this episode. If this was a Kate and Powell episode on its own and this was 11 minutes, like, I don't think I would have liked it. But here it's just like, man, we're doing, like, two other things. I know that this is a longer than episode than normal, but did we need this? Interesting. I'm the exact opposite. I was not here for this Kate and Powell subplot until this moment. And then oh. I, I, like, shot up. I was like, wait a minute, what? They want to kill all the imaginary friends? And, um, you know, this episode is almost like a writing exercise where the writers were like, okay, <laughs> the the ele- the ticking clock element, how many times can we do this in one episode, right? <laughs> how many different ticking cl- how many different ticking clocks can we juggle in one episode? Um, and they really put uh, kind of make that plain as day when uh, Nadine pulls out a literal ticking clock, right? right. So th- th- this is them setting the first of three uh, ticking clocks. But I feel like this is the first time that um, imaginary friend genocide has been introduced as a, as a subplot in Arthur. Yeah, that's I mean, that is literally what's being proposed here. Um, and then where we end up with it kind of for me confirms my groan, but we'll get to it. And yes, at this point, we literally have a ticking clock on the screen and we have our three threads being tied up here. We have George doing his 15 minutes of fame. Arthur has 15 minutes to get back to the school or just to find his report and get back to school. And they have 15 minutes to uh, get the postcard back from Nemo or else all imaginary friends will die. That's the, that's the halfway break of this Arthur episode. And we'll just take a quick break right here before we get into the second half of 15. Hey everybody, it's Lucas from the Elwood City Limits podcast, and if you love ECL, there's a couple of ways to keep up with us. You can go to facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits, at ECL Podcast, that's our Twitter. We take questions on Tumblr, it's elwoodcitylimits.tumblr.com. There is an Instagram as well, Elwood City Limits on Instagram. Of course, if you want to donate to the show and get exclusive content, whether that's our full-length commentary of the Arthur movies, our brand new a bi-weekly PBS Kids review show as well as our video game movie reviews with the Sonic movie review and Pikachu movie review you can check out patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits uh, and that's also going to get you access to the Elwood City Limits Discord which me and Will like to post in from time to time and if you want that sweet sweet Elwood City Limits merch check out teespring.com slash stores slash Elwood hyphen city hyphen limits hyphen store you can listen to the podcast at libsyn.com slash Elwood City Limits, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and there's other podcast apps like Stitcher. And if we're not on your favorite app, let us know. And where can you let us know? Well, that's going to be at ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. That's also where you can send us a question and we'll read it on the show. Finally, if you want to support the podcast, the best way to do so is to tell a friend who likes animation or Arthur or just podcasts in general and to go to our iTunes page and rate us out of five stars. Apparently, that helps podcasts out. Bye, everybody. All right, so we've got the 24 ticking clock set up our three stories. So let's go back to George. He's going into the – this is a radio contest that he's doing. And I love I love it when we get to see radio from the other side. Not too long until you and I will be in radio at this point. Mm. And George is met by – now, did we get this guy's name, the, the host of the show? Um, he He's basically led in – to the radio station by this host. I don't think we got his name, but um, he he has a little he has a little line here where he's just like, "Sorry, my hands are sticky. Just spilled some coffee," and it just reminds me of like that uh, one from Spider Ham and uh, the Spider Verse of just like, "I just wash my hands. That's why they're wet. No other reason." <laughs> this is like a, a very funny way to kind of. He's very like 
So the 15 Minutes of Fame show is meant to be a parody of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which very timely. Now, they're not doing a Regis impression with this one. They've done a Regis impression very briefly before years and years ago at this point. The, this guy's just kind of like a – he comes across as like a, a very like morning talk show huckster kind of guy. Just kind of yeah, like, like a showbiz he, it, type of character. It's definitely like old showbiz because he's got – you know, it looks like the the toupee, and he's got the the purple suit, uh, which is a far cry from the kind of <laughs> radio showbiz hucksters me and you experienced when we were in the radio business. Yes. Um. Uh, eventually, their exterior starts to match the interior. Uh. <laughs> but this is kind of still has the old style glitz and glam. Uh, of showbiz. In fact, George is wearing a tux to an audio. It's an audio medium. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this guy kind of almost reminds me of like, you know, 70s game show, let's make a deal kind of thing. Not like a radio personality. You see radio personalities now. And, you know, when I when I was working there, just like, yeah, you just wear whatever you want. Nobody's looking. Who cares? Depending on where you work. Um, so while that's going on, George is kind of answering these questions, is going to do this show they are broadcasting the show in the auditorium arthur comes back now earlier there was a bit of a mix-up because dave was taking out the paper garbage as well as trying to get arthur's report back to him in doing that he mixed up folders and so he did bring back what he thought was arthur's report he gave it to buster but it turns out it's actually dave's papers that he needed it's for the takahashi mcmillan wedding which i want to go to that wedding well, apparently Buster says that the, you know, the meatballs sound divine, the hors d'oeuvres, so uh, for the food alone, I would go. It just sounds like the coming together of two different cultures, and I can only imagine what Dave Reed would have uh, scared up for that, for, that, uh, for that menu. I'd really like to know. So as this is going on, but, uh, Arthur then has to go back home again and like get the actual – or sorry, Arthur hasn't been back to school at this point. He still is rummaging around for his report um, you know, he's just kind of l- looking around for it. Nothing really ex- too much exciting there. One of the uh, questions that George gets is the wood that's used to make bats. And so I actually made a guess at this. I was pretty confident it would be hickory, but I was dead wrong. Apparently it's ash. But according to Google, maple is also an acceptable substitute. I will also say, so as I mentioned before, 15 Minutes of Fame meant to be who wants to be a millionaire. So every time George is asked a question, you know, is that your confirmed question? Is that your final yes, answer? Exactly, yeah. And he also has a, not a lifeline, but a magic phone call that he can use to call somebody because of course they can't pull the audience and they can't uh, uh, take away two answers because they're not doing multiple choice. So that'll come into play in a little bit. Meanwhile, in the C story, <laughs> same time. <laughs> Uh, Pal goes on a chase with Nemo. He eventually tricks him and uh, gets Nemo to accidentally drop the postcard by intimating that Nemo can't balance on a tree. So he lets go of the postcard. From this, we just get that the Red Claw doesn't actually exist. And so I kind of like this. Nemo just wanted the postcard because he's a cat and he thought it looked neat, which I in the back of my head, I was like, did he just steal that to be a jerk? Yeah, he did. Where the Red Claw stuff came from in the minds of the imaginary friends, I have no idea. I have no idea. Turns out that the imaginary friends themselves might have an overactive imagination. Either Nadine was being uh, intentionally depl- like uh, uh, misleading. Um, I, d- I doubt she, it. Uh, yeah, I doubt it as well. Or uh, she was just easily confused. Or... Um, because Nadine is magic and we're dealing with magic realism, her magic works in mysterious ways. And her red claw thing was in order to compel, uh, well, there's a little bit of, of magic realism in, in kind of the neat little bow that, uh, yeah. this storyline and Arthur's storyline converge. And so you could maybe think about it that way of like the, the lie about the red claw was kind of. Made Dean's way of orchestrating these kind of uh, uh, unlikely events that are about to occur. I will also mention a uh, great Nemo line here. So I, I, I like Nemo's voice actor and, you know, Pal is saying, you know, give, give back that postcard. It's a piece of art. And Nemo says, 
What would you know about art? You eat out of the trash. Mm -mm. (laughs) I was watching this within earshot of my girlfriend, and she was she has no context for who Nemo is, but she was like, "Who is that? That's so mean." (laughs) (laughs) He is a mean little kitty. Anyway, pal gets the (laughs) pal gets the postcard back, and this line kind of sums up at least his part of the episode. Mission accomplished. Not quite sure how, but there you have it. (laughs) So. He gets the he gets the uh, the postcard back and it mixes in with the paper garbage that Dave Reed was throwing out before. Arthur rummages around in that garbage and he finds his report. The secret recipe on the postcard is destroyed by going into a garbage uh, garbage truck. And then we go back to the school. George is still playing the game. He's getting on to the last question as Arthur is booking it to get back. Buster has to make an excuse as to like, he technically did see Arthur earlier that day, so he's not lying to Mr. Ratburn when he says that, but, you know, he needs to get back sooner. Buster's going to be in big trouble. And we actually get so, I, th- I thought this was actually kind of fun, given that it's our anniversary here. We, went earlier on in the episode, if you, er, excuse me, earlier on in the podcast, if you remember, we always likened Arthur to Ferris Bueller a lot with the way he spoke to the camera. That was our way to kind of our language around talking about that. But Arthur is literally hopping through backyards to get back to school quickly. It's a lot like Ferris Bueller. It's a lot like Ferris it's Bueller's true. Day Off, the end of that movie. We've come full circle. Yeah, we really have. I just thought I, they couldn't have known, but I, I thought that was neat. So Arthur does get back to the school in the nick of time as George is using his magic phone call to, again, the final question is Michelangelo's full name, which Arthur would know because he did the report on it. So Arthur gets in in the nick of time as uh, Mr. Haney is hosting this in the uh, auditorium. He gives him the right answer, and George wins 15 minutes of fame. Everything wrapped up pretty well. Mr. Ratburn is almost none the wiser, except that he expects a report on his desk from Arthur and Buster on why Arthur was late to school. But they at least saved no homework day, if not for themselves, then for the rest of the class. So that's it. That is the 15, the season, so that's it. That is the premiere of the 15th season of Arthur with 15. Lucas, six years in, 15. What did you think? I think this bodes very well for the season. You know, I came away from season 14 uh, feeling very positive about the future of Arthur, more positive than I had in the past. It's been a lot of doom and gloom about Flash being around the horizon. And uh, last season, I was like, wow, the writing is kind of hitting its second stride, in my opinion. And so if the writing stays this consistent, uh, there's lots to look forward to. And season 15 didn't disappoint. Already, it feels like a big deal being a two-parter called 15. You know, it feels kind of epic. Um, And I think they kind of rose to the challenge. Uh, Watching a lot of uh, other contemporary uh, children's show on our, our sister podcast, For the Kids... It always kind of makes me groan when it's a full 24-minute episode instead of two separate stories because a lot of kids' shows are very simple, and it gets really boring when you're stretching out a very simple plot for 24 minutes. And so they kind of tackle this in this episode by having a lot going on at all the time with these three different plot points. They're very kinetic. The ticking clock is running out on all three of them, and they're all overlapping. This is maybe an unfair comparison, but it's a little bit of like Arthur's version of like one of those early PTA movies, like Arthur Magnolia, where there's all these kind of uh, stories that are tangentially related and by happenstance are kind of crossing over with one another. Um, But... I think they're all balanced well. I thought it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, I think George going on the game show is is uh, great as kind of the, the A plot. Um, I liked how, you know, George is... They show kind of visually alone, uh, without even saying it, that George is kind of uncomfortable without Wally, but he keeps, like, using Wally as something to help him recall all these other answers for the trivia. Um, I liked Arthur running around and 
kind of the comedy of errors of his report ending up in the trash and all that stuff. Um, I know you weren't as big of a fan of, of as the baby plot, um, but I was a fan of the baby plot just for Uncle Wormy and then the sheer insanity of what they said was actually going down uh, in terms of the the cats trying to kill all of the imaginary, uh, imaginary friends. Now, I will say that the conclusion of the baby plot is by far the weakest part of the episode. Uh, when uh, Pal tricks Nemo to drop the thing, I'm like, okay, well, this is kind of lame. Um, but it all kind of converges in a way that left me very satisfied. And it's also a very, very funny episode. There's lots of little gags. They make use of the extra time to, to introduce kind of some more running gags. You know, Mr. Haney with the microphone. Um, lots of great little moments, like when uh, they're trying to set up the projector for to watch... Um, they're watching, even though it's a radio broadcast, George on 15, and they accidentally put up a picture of Binky at first, and it's like, why do they have that picture of Binky? <laughs> like, uh, like, yeah, like, like shaking his fist at the camera. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like, why does Mr. Haiti have that? Um, <laughs> File photo. Uh, the woman skeeved out on the bus of George with his uh, uh, puppet. Uh, I don't know. I, I was really entertained by this episode. I thought they earned the two-parter, uh, two-part um kind of segments um and i feel like uh it's a smart way to start off season 15 because it makes it feel epic it makes the season feel like it's got momentum uh and kind of makes it feel like a television event something that uh, children's shows aren't often uh afforded the opportunity to be Hmm. i will agree with you i do think arthur's the show's sense of humor is as present as ever and that's always uh, love love to see it There was some really funny parts in this episode, genuinely funny parts. And yes, I also always appreciate the double episode. It does make it feel a little bit more special. Now, you said that it was a kind of a a good omen for the rest of the season. I disagree. I wasn't crazy about this one. Now, I will uh, I will back the or I will back off of that a little bit by saying I think this episode is fine. Like, I like most of the plots in this episode. Like, the the George plot is interesting and fun. The Arthur one adds a little bit of drama. It's just when, again, we get into the dog and baby stuff that I'm just like, okay, I'm like actively starting to tune out. And really, it's a bit worse for me when it's when it is like tangled in with these other stories I'd rather watch at least when it's like an 11 minute segment then it's like okay well we're just we're we're doing this we're here we're committed to it I'll watch it but we keep cutting back to the dog and the baby and I'm just like I can't stop please go back to the other stuff I'm more interested in so I come away with this feeling a lot more lukewarm about it than I thought I was going to um like you said, the that part of the episode doesn't wrap up so well. I don't know. I kind of felt a little bit like it was cool to see George win the thing, but also like the wrap up to Arthur's story is that just like, well, he got there in time, which is oversimplifying it. Granted, the the thrill of that is in, you know, will he make it back in time? You could simplify that stuff a lot. But in the end, it's like, well, Arthur and Buster have to do a little bit of homework. And like, OK, just combine that with the with the C plot. And I'm just like, ah, it. I'm not as enthused as you are. Now, we've uh, that's happened many, many seasons already at this point. We kind of start off on a little bit of a meh, on a meh note, in my opinion. But I'm, I'm hopeful, and I'm certainly going to keep as open a mind as I can for the last traditionally animated season, because I'm not, and, and I don't want to confine the Flash seasons to this, but I just feel like they're going to have a lot more to overcome to stick in my mind and for me to like them. So as much as I say this one kind of didn't do much for me, we'll see if, you know, by this time next year, I'm praying for this kind of episode to come back. Like, be careful what you wish for. There may come a day when when I'm begging to bring back the dog and baby uh, show. So we will see. But I'm... Nevertheless, happy to be moving on to a new season of Arthur. Uh, We still have some episodes coming up this season that a lot of people are really excited for us to talk about, uh, judging on, you know, Vinny's email. We've got one later in the season that I personally can't wait to watch. It sounds like maybe, like, it could, it has the makings of potentially one of the greatest of all time. But that's 
for quite a long time from now. So thank you for joining us for this season 15 premiere of Arthur. And as far as the free feed is concerned, thank you very much for six years. I, I'll, I'll keep this brief because, you know, we're running up to the end here. But, I mean, I, I say it every year, and I mean it every year. I mean it every day. I mean it every time I think of it. We really wouldn't be here without you. Whether you've supported us through Patreon or whether you've subscribed to the podcast, retweeted us, shared a link, told a friend about us, sent an voted email. Voted for us at the Halifax Awards. Voted for us at vote.thecoast.ca in the Best of Halifax Awards. No matter what, if you've interacted with us, if you've told somebody else about us, man, we appreciate that. We wouldn't have been able to make cool friends like we have with some of the interviews we've had. We wouldn't have been able to meet some of the people who have made one of our favorite shows ever. We wouldn't have been able to talk to you guys, whether it's on the Discord or through social media or through emails or whatever. And that's the most important thing to me six years into making this show is the connection that we all share as Arthur fans. It's about nurturing that connection. And I hope that we'll continue to do that. And we continue to do that through you, through your support. And that's as simple as downloading the podcast and taking an hour every week to listen. So thank you. Thank you very much. It makes it all, it makes all the work that we've done feel worth it. And there's a lot more cool stuff to come. And we hope that you'll stick with us. So thank you. No, I can't say much more than that. I, I, I equally appreciate it. Uh, I love doing this every week with you, Will. Uh, it's it, Six years have flown by, and I hope to do it, you know, as long as it's still fun, like we always say. Yes. Um, I, it's, it's listeners like you, I feel like, uh, who are going to get us through those Flash episodes. But I promise I wouldn't <laughs> talk about that anymore. Uh, so right now, I'm just enjoying our sixth year uh, and the 15th season of Arthur. So let's give you a little quick preview of what's going to come up in the next few weeks. Next week, we are going back to the Patreon, and that will be, again, on our proper six-year anniversary. So patrons, celebrate with us as we talk about Super Why on For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast. Hey, patrons, uh, we need to know what episodes we what episode we should be watching of Super Why. So uh, send us a Patreon message or go in the Discord and give us some episode recommends, please. Uh, we need to know what we should be watching because this is one that a lot of you have been waiting for. On Friday, August the 26th, we are going to be uploading our interview with the Betamax King to the free feed. This is a great one. This was uh, this was Lucas's uh, thing. He reached out and got this interview with another local legend who I feel should be honored in the Best of Halifax Awards. Uh, the Betamax yes. King. Check check him out on YouTube. Uh, he was really gracious with his time. We got to talk about the type of YouTube content he makes. It's a great interview, and I really have Lucas to thank for this one because he did a lot of the footwork for it. Uh, I would go as far as to say that Betamax King is at the helm of my favorite YouTube channel of all time. So if you want to know more about that, uh, definitely listen to that episode. It's one of my favorite things we've ever done on the show in these past six years. And, of course, and full disclosure with that week, I'm going to be on vacation that week because my birthday is coming up at the end Ooh. of the month. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be on vacation. The week after that, it's going to run into my vacation, birthday, and Lucas, I mean, not to blow up your spot or anything, I won't say where to, but you're going to be doing a little bit of a move, so you're going to be busy, man. So we are going to have to take a week off from what would normally be a Patreon week. And we are going to, in lieu of that... We are going to put a word from us kids onto the main feed. That is our episode with Catherine Dorr and Holly Holland, former word from us kids. Some great, great response from that so far. Catherine has also let me know that some people have reached out to her after hearing that episode on Patreon. As always, if you decide to do that or to Holly Holland, please be respectful and honor their space. Now, so that's going to be coming out September 2nd here on the free feed. You'll be able to hear it. It's a full hour long, two conversations, two great interviews. I'm really excited for you to hear it and to hear your feedback from it. September the 9th, we will be back on the Patreon again since we'll be taking two weeks off from it. September 9th, 
will be our next episode of For the Kids, which we will determine next week because it'll be Lucas's pick. So we won't be coming back to For the Kids until early September, and we won't be back with ECL until mid-September. We're coming back with the second episode of Season 15, I Want to Hold Your Hand and Whistling in the Wind. So, I mean, that's that's a lot of information to give to you, so just keep in mind, next week, Super Y, week after that, Betamax King for free. Week after that, A Word From Us Kids for free. The week after that, for the kids, patrons only. And then the week after that, we return to ECL and the normal posting schedule. We're taking a little bit of time off for the end of summer, for my birthday, and for life allowances. So uh, thank you for your patience, and we will be back. I mean, we're still going to be making cool content for patrons and for y'all on the free feed. So we're not stopping. We're just uh, changing things up a little as we change seasons and as, well, we start to get back to school. Back to school. Fall is almost here. By the time by, by the time we're back for Elwood City Limits, it... When is the first day of fall, actually? Uh, first day of fall. I'm going to do the Lucas thing. Well, we'll be right on the doorstep of fall, for goodness sakes. So, for I mean, for both of us, enjoy the rest of your summer. You'll still hear from me on the free feed here and there as I introduce the new stuff. But, you know, for me and Lucas, have a great rest of your summer. Uh, if you're in America and you're starting school again, have a great school year. And, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for sticking with us. So, for Elwood City, so for Elwood City limits, my name's Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini, I'm Toast. You look more like a bagel to me. <laughs> I like that one too. Have a great.